Look at that. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Jaradovac, and today I'm going to discuss the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and which is called the DMCA, and also the appropriate takedown notices that the DMCA allows. So first things first, we always like going over a roadmap. And the first thing we're going to explain is what is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act? The second thing is what are the safe harbors and what are takedown notices? The third thing is we're going to be talking a little bit about anti-circumvention, copyright management information protection, which are some protections that the DMCA allows for both internet service providers and users or copyright holders. We're going to talk about the different types of takedown notices, and then we're going to talk about some shortcuts. So first things first, the Digital Millennium Copyright was enacted in 1998. It is a bit of US law that's codified under 17 USC code section 512, 1201, and 1202. Now the first thing we need to think about, oh shoot, I'm not sharing my screen, so I'm just looking at a cool PowerPoint myself. So think about 1998, yahoo.com was the most trafficked website, avista.com was the, AltaVista was the second most trafficked website, and then I think one of the Disney websites or a, a the aggregate of all the Disney websites were in the top 15. So 1998 was a completely different time. And during that time, we had more of these large websites who were allowing more people to share information or content. And then they were informational too. So people were uploading articles, people were uploading pictures. Now, the, legisla the legislators named this the Digital Millennium Copyright Act because it was enacted right before the year 2000. Now, what they wanted to do was they wanted to amend existing U.S. copyright law because there was a lot of uncertainty with who would be liable if an infringing piece of content or a copyrighted piece of content was uploaded onto an Internet service provider's platform without the consent or authorization from that copyright owner. Who would be liable? So at the inaction of this DMCA gave internet service providers a little bit more clarity on if they were liable or not. It gave them an out to be part of a safe harbor if any of their users use infringing content on their platform. It provided more certainty for copyright owners and it made it unlawful for people to provide false copyright information when trying to upload a piece of content or material on the internet as well. So one of the first sections that we're gonna discuss just really briefly is uh, section 512. So this discussed the safe harbors and the notice and takedown systems that the internet service providers need to comply with in order to fall under the safe harbor. Now, first we gotta ask, what is this takedown system? So the statute provides that an internet service provider must have a registered agent with the Library of Congress to uh, act as an agent for service of process in case the library received any copyright infringement notices. So that way, the Library Con of Congress can send it to the internet service provider. Now, having an agent for service of process cuts down the legwork for the government because an individual who believes their work is being infringed, they can find the agent of service of process and then send it directly to that uh, website. Now, in the past, before 1998, the only recourse that copyright owner would have would be to start litigation. And, you know, the legislators saw that in an increase in the internet boom and how it was going to get bigger and bigger, they wanted to give these copyright owners another out, another avenue to protect themselves without having to go through the costly and timely expense of litigation. So in exchange for providing these copyright owners the ability to take down to send essentially cease and desists to the internet service providers, the internet service providers were required to take down any infringing copyright or any infringing content that is on their site. And if they do so within a reasonable amount of time, um, then they will be under the safe harbor. They will not be liable for that infringing content. Another thing that the DMCA added was for anti-circumvention. I included the language from the statute in this slide because um, you just have to remember, because I just want to provide it for context. We have to remember that this was created in 1998, meaning that, <laughs> you know, MySpace wasn't around yet. There weren't too many social media apps. 
At that time, there weren't too many websites that allowed mass users to upload content on their own without a lot of back-end engineering and without you know, coding it into the website. So here, this anti-circumvention provision is, um, when people put a piece of content online, a copyrighted material, and then someone creates a paywall to put over it, if you attempt to try to bypass that paywall, if you try to add an attachment onto your computer uh, that bypasses those paywalls or any type of barrier that is supposed to protect copyrighted works, that's illegal. Now, what we've been seeing in the last 20-something years is this, has, this particular statute is a little bit toothless because, I mean, there, I just Googled last night, there's a lot of different Google Chrome attachments that will purposely bypass people's paywalls. Now, one, one good thing about this section, and I just want to give a little highlight about it, is back in 2015, Canada enacted a similar statute, and the first case that came up was not against an individual who hacked into a system, but it went against an individual whose friend was a subscriber of a news source. His friend received an email with an article that was copyrighted. His friend copied that email, pasted it to his other buddy. And it, him sending that email to his buddy, that means that he, was, he, had anti, he had circumvented the protections that were applied for, on that website because he received that information, that copyrighted material, in a way that was not going through the paywall. Now, if that puts you up in arms, it should because... I think that that was an overreach, but I just want to let you know what some of the first types of cases were. The second statute that was altered and added was Section 1202, which is the Copyright Management Info Information Protection. So what this means, this is another fancy way of saying that it is unlawful to, distrib to distribute false copyright management information. So in 1998, just imagine if you have to go into a website and say, I am the owner of this copyright. This is the owner. This is where they live. And this is also the copyright number in the Library of Congress. You know, some of these automated processes will allow you to go to the next level because they don't have enough reference points to check whether you are the correct owner, you are the, that is the correct uh, number, and other information. So this section allows it to be, is, requires it to be unlawful for anyone to upload content and say it's theirs when it really, or say works are theirs when those works are not theirs and they do not have the copyright to distribute that. So this is where the teeth are. And this is, this is I use this a lot actually. So in that first section, 512, where we talk about safe harbors and notice and takedown systems, we're talking about in order for an internet service provider to fall in the safe harbor and not be liable for copyright infringement if one of their users uploads an infringing piece of content or work on their website, they have to comply with several different requirements. And one of them is that they need to have a portal where individuals are able to uh, complain and send cease and desists about infringing co content or infringing works. So. If you're going to look at the right side, this is the very, very, very basic template. This is what they're providing you on copyright.gov. And this is really all you need. You just need to say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I certify that I am the owner or so my client is the owner of the following works. And then that's where I start uh, creating URLs and websites showing which work they own. Even if it is an in-real-life painting or an in-real-life video, I will post, I will share URLs of my client um, at a press release or at a different uh, event where they are absolutely the owner of that, that content or that work. You are going to, oops. So if, you have to say who owns the work and what work is being infringed upon. And then you need to show which work is infringing on your copyrights or infringing on your client's copyrights. In the most practicable sense right now, a lot of this is happening online. So a lot of this can be done with links. You don't even need to have screenshots. You could just put links in there, and those links will be sufficient. So it'll be located at this URL website infringes the copyright I put up here above. 
this is very important language. I have a good faith belief that the use of the works described above in the materials listed here is not authorized by the copyright owner, an agent of the copyright owner, or the law, which could be uh, free use, um, free use, public access, those, those t fair use, sorry, fair use and public access and those type of exemptions. That's what the law means. I request that you expeditiously remove or disable access to the material identified directly above and you give them your notice requirements right here. Uh, this is a big part that's going to be on every single DMCA takedown notice. Under penalty of perjury, I test that the information in this notification is accurate and that I am authorized to act on behalf of the owner of, or of the rights being infringed in the material listed above. The reason why this is important is because this is a takedown notice. You're sending a cease and desist letter with this. And one reason that they have to include this is because there's a lot of people who send cease and desist when they actually don't own the copyright. Right now, if people are fraudulently claiming their own copyrights, I have yet to see any actions against those individuals for um, not complying with Section 1202, which is not providing any false information regarding the ownership of the copyright. So that'll be interesting to pay attention to later on. This next slide, because y'all know me and I always try to uh, I always try to go to the next level, right? So this is a sample DMCA takedown notice that you can submit on behalf of your clients. This letter is a little bit more structured. It looks like a lawyer wrote it, and it is much easier to fill out in my opinion because right here, whoops, uh, can you all see my mouse? Yes or no? Okay, cool. Um, so right here, the exclusive rights are being violated by material available upon your site at the following URLs. So this is where you put the infringing materials link. So like one, two, three, four. I have good faith belief that the use of this material in such a fan is not authorized by the copyright holder, the copyright holder's agent, or applicable law. Same information as before. Under penalty of perjury, blah, 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 blah. I certify that the information contained in this notification is accurate and that I'm authorized to act on behalf. And I may be contacted here. I hereby request that, whoops that you remove or disable access to all material as it appears on your service in an expedient fashion as possible. Thank you. Now, you're also going to include the URLs of the actual content that you own, too. So what happens if you send this notice? If you send this notice to an internet service provider, they have the obligation, if they want to stay within that safe harbor, to immediately take down that infringing piece of copy or that content. That's without any type of that's the word I'm looking for. Any type of subjectivity, they are objectively taking your content down and they have bots who will be taking that content down. Now, it, are, you may be infringing on the content, you may not be, but you will not be able to argue your case before your piece of content or your material gets taken off the internet. And if you believe that your content or your material or your works have wrongfully been taken off the internet, there's something called a DMCA counter notice. So th what you're seeing right here is if you receive a notice on a website that you're uh, most practical, practical, you're on social media, you post a piece of content and include some copyrighted material, you believe it's fair use, they believe that you're infringing on their copyrights. You see this a lot with brands who do this um, to individuals who are providing reviews on their products that they don't like. So they start, you know, they, of course they're, they're copyrights in the video, and then they send a DMCA takedown notice hoping that the individual on the other side doesn't realize that they can send a counter notice. So then they'll just ha have that piece of content down. They won't fight back about it. They might make another video or two, but ultimately the video's gone, right? Because this person's not taking the next step. So the next step is to respond to the social media app or the internet service provider with another uh, document here, which is a counter notification. If once you send this counter notification to the internet service provider, they have the obligation to put your material, put your work back on the internet between no less than 10 days and no more than 14 business days later, right? They're going to be putting, it's going to be down for a while. Um, if they don't, they don't have the obligation to put your content back on the internet. If the original notice sender has filed a court action. So that's, that's when they won't put your content back on. One interesting thing to think about is 
this can kill a viral video. This can kill a movement. This can kill trends. And this is something that I've been seeing a lot more on the internet now where people are disagreeing with certain information or disagreeing with certain um, mindsets where instead of flagging that content as inappropriate, they're starting to send improper and unlawful DMCA takedown notices because they know that the internet service providers automatic bots don't get to subjectively look at that complaint. They will just receive a complaint and since someone signed that under penalty of perjury, the website will take it down immediately, typically. So you saw that happen a lot to uh, the Black Lives Matter protests last year. It happened a lot to the Native American uh, movements that have been going on and you know it's it's not cool but it's good that we know about it so we can try acting around it so one thing before you start selling your client a thousand dollar dmca takedown notice i think it is prudent to also offer them the ability to do it themselves so a lot of these internet service providers must have an agent of service a process and you can find them on these particular URL links where you can fill out the information that would normally be on a DMCA takedown notice and then that internet service provider takes it, takes down that piece of content and then you're still in the process. And that's all without you having to reach out to the other side's legal team. Uh, I've done it both ways. I've had success with the shortcuts and when the shortcuts didn't work, I also had success uh, sending it to their general, sending DMCA takedown notices to their legal counsel. Those ones get viewed faster. So thank you. That's a little bit about DMCA takedown notices. Uh, this is a barrister's presentation, so I've, I hope you all appreciate the final slide. And I just want to open up for any questions.